When I first studied Byzantine and medieval history, I wasn't really left with the impression that the iconoclastic controversy had been all that impactful. But now that I really re-examine this period as a whole and look at everything that happens in Europe, I see that this period of um, iconoclasm actually had a pretty big impact on both the course of Byzantine history and on the course of history in Western Europe. And that's why I'm beginning this week with a discussion of this controversy. So let's talk about the first iconoclast era from 726 to 787, and then that will set us up to talk about Charlemagne and all the things that happen in Western Europe a lot more smoothly. If we want to gain a proper understanding of iconoclasm's impact, we first need to understand what it is, and that understanding begins with defining what an icon is. Now, in Greek, the word ikones means image, and an icon, therefore, is any kind of image which has a religious significance, and specifically a Christian religious significance. You can also have icons in other religions, but this controversy is all intra-Christian. So, basically, iconoclasm is the idea that involving icons in worship is a violation of the commandment against making graven images, that it is worshiping an image rather than actual God himself. And what iconoclastic leaders really want to do is remove images from churches and government buildings, and sometimes their hatred of icons extends to openly persecuting iconophiles. Um, that's a term used by some scholars to describe the people who are in favor of icons. It means lovers of icons. Um, there's another term that scholars sometimes use, but it is a bit less intuitive, and I will avoid it during this presentation. So let's look at the deep origins of icons and iconoclasm. It's very likely that there had always been some Christians who were uncomfortable with the veneration of icons, since after all, the commandment against the veneration of images went all the way back to the Old Testament, which predates Christianity by some centuries. Now, um, icon usage grew quite a bit during the 5th and 6th centuries CE, and it's very probable that the origins of this um, opposition to icons would have really intensified during that period um, as these things became more prominent. Artistically speaking, the biggest influence for icons was from the Hellenized Near East, and what I mean by that are countries like Syria and Egypt, which each had their own ancient art styles, which were then influenced by what is known as Greco-Roman realism during the Hellenistic period and the subsequent Roman period. Um, and then sort of that amalgam of styles became the Byzantine art style, which is seen in icons. So 2D iconography from Byzantium was more or less the height of medieval art prior to the Renaissance, when things became more focused on realism and sort of 3D effects. So in that sense, in many ways, the Byzantines were effectively the Sega Saturn of 2D art. And for those of you who don't get the reference, you don't need to, but if you really want to understand that, then I suggest you read up on the Sega Saturn. I couldn't resist, it was too easy of an opportunity to drop an obscure video game reference. Anyway, back to Byzantine stuff. So, icons were gaining in propaganda value and they were becoming more and more associated with individuals and families during the 5th to 7th centuries. And that could also have triggered some people to oppose them. Um, they could have seen this as an impious practice to try to glorify yourself by using an icon which is supposed to represent the divine. That could be seen as impious. It could be seen as unchristian. Now, this was upped quite a bit by the Emperor Justinian II, who actually put Christ on the obverse of his coins, and the obverse is the front. And most numismatic experts believe that the obverse of a coin was more important than the reverse. Um, so Justinian would put Christ in the front and himself on the back. So it's a way to use the iconography of Christ to enhance his own prestige, legitimacy, and influence. Um, Justinian II also presided over the Quintessext Council, and this council mandated that Christ only be represented in his human form, rather than just as a cross or as a Cairo. And what this would have done is really trigger people who were 
in favor of using more abstract forms of representing Christ. So if someone favored it for even stylistic reasons or had a theological reason for doing so, then the um, intervention by an unpopular emperor to prevent that would have roused quite a bit of resentment against it. And if you look at the chronology of the outbreak of iconoclasm, it happens under Leo III beginning in 726, and Justinian II had only left office in 711, so this was still a potentially somewhat fresh, or at least um, something that would be within living memory. Uh, so keep that in mind. Before we talk about this iconoclastic controversy itself, I'd like to first talk about some of the difficulties in understanding it. And most of those difficulties stem from the limitations of our sources. So first of all, this is the 8th century. It's at the heart of the Byzantine Dark Age, which means that the number of sources that we have are pretty limited. And of those sources that we do have, all of them are later, and they're written from an iconophilic perspective. So people like Theophanes the Confessor was in favor of the use of icons. We also have a scholar, John of Damascus, who was writing from the Caliphate, and he was in favor of icons. He was a Christian writer at the time, even though he was under the Caliphate. So, um, basically the only arguments that we know are the ones from people in favor of icons, and some of them were writing with the knowledge that the iconophile position had won out. Um, now, not surprisingly, given the nature of the sources, iconoclast rulers are absolutely reviled in our sources. Um, Leo III and his son Constantine V are greatly reviled in the sources and portrayed as just absolute monsters. However, from what we can tell from other evidence, it looks like they were actually pretty successful and that they were popular in their own times. Uh, we don't really see a lot of evidence of revolts against them or them having to worry about crowds rioting and killing them or anything like that. And most importantly, we actually don't really know what the arguments against, icon uh, against icons actually were. We can kind of guess because we know about the biblical commandment and some other stuff, but we don't know the specific arguments in any kind of detail. So keep that in mind. Uh, therefore, Fortunately for me, that means we don't have to talk about the theology of it. But um, if you were actually interested in that, sad news, there's not really a lot to talk about. So I don't know if that makes you happy or sad, but let's move on anyway. If you know anything about academia, you know that the less evidence that is available, the more creative license that scholars will apply to an issue. So let's look at some of the proposed causes for the iconoclastic controversy at this time. Um, one theory is that this is a product of Neoplatonic philosophy. Bas that basically the um, idea is that an icon is only a representation of something much more real like Christ and that therefore it is inferior to and does not do just glory to what it represents. However, we also know from some sources, um, especially John of Damascus, that he makes a similar argument in favor of icons, that by representing something that it serves as a sort of mental trigger or reminder. So that argument could cut both ways, and I imagine that the people who used Neoplatonic philosophy as an explanation um, for destroying icons could have easily um, you know, used it in the opposite way. So I think that this explanation doesn't quite work since this could easily cut either direction. Theophanes, the confessor, is a pretty typical bigoted Christian of his day, and he um, ascribes this all to the Jews and Arabs. And his particular story involved a Jewish wizard, uh, which is basically a racial stereotype at the time, and an Arab vizier, basically an advisor who was trying to convince the emperor Leo III that the superior Umayyad Caliphate was engaging in no icons and was succeeding, whereas Byzantium using its icons was struggling and that wasn't coincidental. Um, that solution has a little bit of merit to the extent that Jews and Arabs did not use icons. Or Arabs should actually be Muslim in this case, but you know what I mean. Um, and you could 
possibly interpret that as Leo looking at people who are having a little bit more success during this period and saying, well, maybe they just have more favor from God and maybe the problem with our relationship with God is our use of icons. Maybe that's what it was and maybe he was convinced by Jewish or Arab visitors. Impossible to say. Um, not 100% implausible, but maybe a bit too reductionist. And it, let's look at the worst explanation. So a lot of old school scholars, especially people from the gentleman scholar period, which stretches from the 19th century until about the 50s, um, saw the icon issue as a struggle between Eastern and Western elements in the Byzantine Empire. And they saw the icons as being sort of the Western element, and the reason for thinking that is that the Pope would support icons, and then the East um, would be anti-icon because the East is associated with Islam. This is sort of a dumb argument, and it ignores the fact that the Eastern half of the Byzantine Empire had been lost for a while now, and that it had never really held sway in Byzantine theology anyway, since the East was always full of heretics, like the Nestorians. Um, and this whole idea of an Eastern-Western struggle um, is pretty old-fashioned, and it doesn't really hold a lot of water, um, if you really look at it. The explanation that I favor is the one by Tim Gregory in his textbook on Byzantine history. And that is basically that it's a combination of the personal belief of Leo III, who seems to have thought that icons were a bad thing, and his autocratic style of governance where he believed that as emperor it was his right and responsibility to correct the intellectual and moral failings of his people. And using Tim Gregory's interpretation, I'm going to move forward with this presentation and look at the actual events of the iconograph or iconoclastic controversy. In 717, Leo III took power and founded the Asarian dynasty. Now when he came in, it probably looked like he was just going to be yet another minor ruler who would then be overthrown within a few years. He inherited absolute chaos. He was about the fifth emperor in a span of maybe six or seven years. Um, so this was not a promising career path to become emperor in the early 8th century in Byzantium. Now, after securing some successes over the first decade or so of his rule, he began to really gain confidence and to try to seek solutions for the long term. And like a lot of people of his day, he believed that God controlled um, the fate of states. So when he looked at the volcanic disaster at Thera, um, which happened around 725 or 726, and then he looked at this ongoing struggle against the Arabs, who were people who did not use icons, he began to maybe think that this was God's judgment against the Byzantine Empire, and that by continually pitting the Byzantines against the Arabs, that God was trying to send a message to stop using icons. And this would make sense if we think that Leo III had a personal view that icons were wrong or bad in some way. Now, the evidence that Tim Gregory uses to try to make this argument is that Leo III published the Ecloga, which is a law code, or not necessarily a law code, but more like a handbook to law. And this, along with other, actually shows that he was comfortable acting by fiat and just telling people what's what and how to think and how to behave. Um, this was pretty typical for Byzantine emperors, but Leo III was more autocratic than most. Now, in 726, he began to try to remove icons from different buildings, and, and then in 730, he took it a step further and he declared icons illegal and ordered that all of them be confiscated by the state. This led to the destruction of many icons and the loss of a lot of art. Um, however, it's worth noting that Leo III never actually persecuted any individual people. He, con he condemned icons, but he never went after people who used icons. So, if you were caught with icons, they would be confiscated, but you wouldn't be removed from office or really punished in any way. And that's a fairly major distinction with what happens under the reign of his son. So, the foreign policy repercussions of Leo III's ban on icons began immediately. Now, the Pope at the time was Gregory III, 
and he immediately condemned this practice in the East, and this caused a church schism which took quite a while to heal. Now, the papacy had been long in favor of using icons, which should come as no surprise to anyone who's ever seen a Catholic church, especially one in Europe. Um, and we've discussed in the past that the papacy had been trying to um, escape from the orbit of Byzantine political power for some time. And we've also discussed when we looked at the Lombards how they would sometimes side with the Lombards against the Byzantines for short periods of time in order to assert the independence of the papacy. Well, this provides accelerant to that process. Um, and now there is a theological issue that the papacy actually cares about. Before, some of the times when the popes would um, assert themselves in theological matters, those were entirely Greek issues based on Greek linguistic problems. But now this is something that the papacy can fully wrap its head around, and as it has become less and less dependent upon Byzantine power, uh, the papacy is now able to fight much more vigorously against the doctrines that it opposes. Um, this further becomes an issue for Byzantine power in Italy, because Leo III has really no interest in Italian affairs, and maybe he thinks that religious reconciliation was out of the question due to his own fervor for the issue and the equal but opposite fervor that the Pope was displaying at the time. So, more or less, this is something which will have a very detrimental impact on Byzantine power in Italy. When Constantine V succeeded to the throne in 741, he came in as a highly learned theologian and he was eager to put his theological views into practice by using the power of the imperial throne. Um, and for that reason, since uh, you know m this, all the sources were hostile to the iconoclast, and since Constantine V was the chief of all the iconoclast, he is the most reviled and hated Byzantine emperor according to our sources. So much so that he actually earned the nickname Capramimas, which means dung name, and this re, um, relates to a story when he was an infant and he was baptized. And supposedly when he was in the baptismal waters, he had to go number two, and that is where his name came from. Now I can't really imagine a case where an emperor who was liked by writers would be chastised for something he did as an infant. But Constantine V was so hated by later writers that that is something which stuck to him. Um, it probably also stuck to him if he did it in the water too, I don't know. Anyway, um, this is a great example of that source bias I was talking about earlier. Because so far as we can tell, Constantine V was actually a highly successful and very popular emperor in his own time. And it looks like he had numerous successes um, and he reclaimed parts of the Balkans and did lots of really cool stuff. So, one of the first things that he does in regard to the iconoclast controversy, however, is that he holds a church council that he presides over personally. He packs it with guys who agree with him, and they condemn icons pretty clearly. So this gives an official church sanction to what his dad had already been doing. And now that he has this church sanction on his side, he goes and he tries to purge the army and the bureaucracy of iconophiles. So he's getting rid of everyone who, in his mind, worships icons and is a heretic. Um, he also attempted to go further than this by condemning cults of saints and relics. The one thing that he does leave alone, however, is the true cross, which was potentially just too much ingrained in uh, Byzantine culture since this is something that had been... Um, brought to Constantinople by Constantine the Great. Uh, he also may have personally gone to churches and scraped off icons. And maybe it was a symbolic gesture like the when leaders like to cut ribbons or uh, make the first uh, scoop of dirt with a shovel. But he may have been motivated enough to personally work in the trenches in this affair. I don't know. Anyway, the point is that Constantine V was very dedicated to destroying icons. This was not a casual interest, and it is the thing that he's best known for, despite the fact that he did lots of other stuff, and that in every other aspect of his life, he was pretty much 100% successful.
please note that just before this, I said almost entirely successful. One of the enduring consequences of the schism between Leo III and the papacy is that the position of the Byzantines continued to decline in Italy under Constantine V. Part of this was his own fault. Constantine V does not seem to have paid any real attention to Italy. This was not a priority for him. Now, um, in 751, under Constantine's reign, the Lombards were able to seize Ravenna and end Byzantine presence in northern Italy forever. So that means that the Exarchate of Ravenna no longer exists after 751, and this happens on Constantine V's watch. Presumably, he was in a strong enough position that he could have reinforced Ravenna and held on to a city which had been under Byzantine control for about 230 years at this point, but he did not. Um, so that is a big stain on his otherwise very impressive record. At this point, popes are now equally or more comfortable dealing with Frankish rulers when they need help against the Lombards. Um, after all, the Franks are Catholic. They are not heretics who are smashing icons. And unlike the Byzantines who often try to equate the authority of the patriarch with the pope, the Franks are perfectly content to say, yes, the pope is the highest authority in the church. So if you're the pope, you kind of like that. You know, that's kind of nice. And the Franks are more interested in the welfare of the papacy. Now, before, a lot of the friendship between Byzantium and the popes had been because the Byzantines would look out for the security of Rome. However, um, Leo III and Constantine V not only were heretics in the eyes of the Pope, but they were heretics who didn't care one way or the other about the fate of the papacy. And that is largely why the papacy will begin to befriend people like Pepin and Charlemagne. In 775, Constantine V died, and then his son Leo IV, the Khazar, took over. He is called the Khazar because his mother was a Khazar princess, and that shows some of the diplomacy of Constantine V, but we won't get into that for now. At any rate, Leo IV was married to a woman named Irene, and she was an iconophile, and possibly that helped soften Leo's attitude towards iconoclasm, and he decided to really back off. Um, so he ended his father's persecutions against iconophiles on an individual level and reverted to his grandfather Leo III's policy of just preventing icons from being erected and confiscating them when they were found. He only ruled for five years, however, and he died at the age of 30, and at that point the empire was officially under his nine-year-old son Constantine VI, but it was mostly ruled by his iconophile wife Irene. Um, that will have consequences that we'll talk about, but first let's take a look at this coin. This is the obverse and reverse of a coin from Leo IV. On the obverse, the front, is a picture of Leo and his son Constantine IX. And on the back is a picture of his father and grandfather. Um, that would be Constantine V and Leo III, respectively. So this is one of the coolest dynastic coins that I've seen, and I just wanted to point it out. And it also shows that the Asarian dynasty had uh, gone away from the style of coinage introduced by Justinian II, where Christ was on the obverse. And that tells you a lot about the iconoclastic attitude of this dynasty, and how far it extended into their self-representation. So in 780, the Empress Irene was more or less left in charge of the Byzantine Empire following the death of her husband Leo IV. Irene, above all else, was a ruthless politician, and her primary goal was to reinstate the icons. Um, now, to achieve this end, she needed to put around her people who were sympathetic to her cause. After three generations of rulers who were iconoclast, that means that many of the highest officials in government and also many common people had adopted iconoclastic views. So this was going to be an uphill struggle. So her first step was to get a patriarch on her side. And because uh, the current patriarch had been someone who was uh, in favor of iconoclasm, she decided to get him replaced. And the person who she could most count on was someone who was not even in the church, her secretary, Teresius. So she pulls some strings to get him ordained as a priest, 
and then he is elected almost immediately to become patriarch. You can imagine that would have stirred up some resentment. Uh, there were a lot of people waiting in line who had been lifelong churchmen and probably had some ambition of becoming the patriarch. And all of a sudden, this guy from the bureaucracy just leapfrogged all of them and took over um, and was now the highest official of the Eastern Church. So, pretty bold move by Irene there. Um, now, she also decided to convene a church council at the Church of the Holy Apostles in 786 and try to get this done while she was still in charge and before her son assumed the throne. Um, however, there were iconoclasts within the imperial army in the capital, and they began a riot because they were in favor of continuing iconoclasm. And this forced Irene to shut down these proceedings. Um, and in order to ensure the future success of her efforts, she decided to send these troops to Asia Minor, on the pretext they were going to go on a campaign in the east, but when they got there, they were dismissed from service for you know being disloyal and engaging in a mutiny. So she got rid of the opponents who uh, had prevented her previous success, and now she was ready to try again to restore the icons. So the year after her failure at the Church of the Holy Apostles, Irene convened a second council, this time at Nicaea, which makes it the second council of Nicaea. Um, in her mind, it was probably as or more important than the first council, which had been held by Constantine the First. And she holds this conference under Patriarch Tiresias, who probably has pretty strict instructions. And this council condemned iconoclasm. So this was another loaded council similar to the one convened by Constantine V. And what happens is that rather than really going after iconoclasts the way that iconoclasts under Constantine V had gone after iconophiles, she decided to allow iconoclasts to repent and then retain their office and standing, no harm, no foul. Which is a pretty smart move, because if you're Irene, you need to maintain the support of officialdom. As a woman ruler, you are pretty vulnerable. And your young son is not quite all that established either, so you want to make sure that there aren't any major challenges to the throne before he really entrenches himself into power. Um, at the same time, Irene t did something which she probably later regretted. Um, in 787, she called off the betrothal between young Constantine VI and Charlemagne's son, Rotrude. And then she held a bridal show and selected a wife for her son. Now, her son Constantine VI would take control in 790 when he was about 19 or so, but then he and his mother would butt heads over who was really in charge. Constantine would then gain a lot of um, stigma in public because he divorced the wife his mother had chosen for him and took another, and that enabled Irene to maneuver against him and have her partisans blind him and then leave her as the empress in 797. So, pretty convoluted chain of events, but if you wondered why I labeled her as a ruthless politician, I think those doubts should be resolved by now. So, uh, if you're able to able and willing to blind your own son to take power, you're pretty damn ruthless. I'm going to go ahead and make a somewhat unorthodox argument. And that argument is that Charlemagne was the biggest winner of the iconoclast controversy in the Byzantine Empire. Um, had the Byzantines been able to maintain a presence in Italy during the 8th century, had Constantine V ensured that Ravenna had held out, then this event happening is a lot less likely. The papacy would have still had to worry about Byzantine power, and possibly some popes would have been inclined to try to stick with the ally that they had had for centuries rather than going with these newfangled Franks. So um, had the Byzantines retained their presence in northern Italy, it's quite likely that Charlemagne would have not risen to the office of emperor in the year 800. Um, now, officially, this would cause further problems. So the neglect of Italy by the Asarians would then cause more problems for Byzantium going forward. Um, since the deposition of Romulus Augustulus in 476 and the death of Julius Nepos in 480, no one in the West had claimed the imperial crown except for a failed usurper or two who hadn't gotten very far. So, 
This was a huge event for the Byzantines because this really undermines their claim to be unique. Um, they're the only ones who have an emperor. So officially, the Byzantine government sees Charlemagne as a usurper who's taking up a title that he does not have or that he does not have a claim to. Now, um, for Irene, this will become problematic because not only is she automatically vulnerable for being a female ruler and a female ruler who blinded her own son, but she is unable to deal with this distant western usurper. And that means that the plots against her at home will thicken. There are already many, but because she's not really able to deal with either of these threats to her power, people have more trouble taking her seriously. Now, we also see Irene's desperation because around this time, Charlemagne proposed that the two of them get married. And this would have really legitimated him as an emperor. Um, and she was in such a weak position at home and so vulnerable that she actually considered it. And uh, we can only imagine what would have happened if Irene and Charlemagne had gotten married. Now, both of them by this point are too old to have children together, but still. I mean, can you imagine having the king of the Franks um, on the Byzantine throne? That would be incredible. This would be a reunification of the Roman world, but possibly bigger and also a little bit different territorially. Um, it really is hard to imagine. However, uh, Irene had to reject the offer because of pressure at home, and now that the rumors of her possibly trying to marry Charlemagne got out, she became even more vulnerable, and she eventually gets deposed by the Emperor Nicephorus in the year 802. So again, to recap, what I'm arguing here is that the iconoclastic uh, controversy in Byzantium is something which has a huge impact on Western Europe because not only does it enable the papacy to break away more and more from the um, uh, sort of orbit of Byzantium, but it also opens the door for Charlemagne to become the chief power in Italy and to declare himself emperor. So. I think this is a perfect segue into our next conversation about the Emperor Charlemagne and why he was the most important figure in Western European history during the Middle Ages.